out of our heart chakra, we see the globe of the planet floating in the womb of the cosmos, being filled with the white light of divine love. As we take a deep breath, we all seal this prayer with the words, and so it is together. And so it is. And Spirit just says to tell you that I have answered even before you have asked. It is done. Oh, we're on. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I want to welcome to all of you that are at the Wednesday morning class that are present. Thank you for coming. And to you that are joining us online and you that will join us later. This is the beginning of a new class in which we're going to focus on setting the context so that we can have the content. Hmm? The context. The context is kind of the bigger picture of where the smaller perception fits into. And without understanding that, I think uh, we sometimes are more vulnerable to uh, teachings uh, that are out there that may take us away from our own inner truth. And that's what we're trying to rely on and get in touch with is the innate truth that is in us. And you that have been in this class a long time know that the truth with a capital T, somebody tell me what the truth with a capital T is. Ooh. Well, maybe repeat these classes. Mm -hmm. See, there's a difference in what is true. What is true today is relative. Just watching the um, State of the Union last night and realizing that everybody sitting there believes that what they believe is true. And if, you, if they believe what is true is different from what somebody believes is true, who knows what the truth is? So we're kind of just making up what is true right now. But I'm not talking about true and truism. I'm talking about what the truth is. So I'm going to back up again and go through this again. Jesus, Yeshua the teacher, my sample example I'm going to use today, stood before the powers of his time. The political power of his time, which was Pilate. And Pilate said according to the English version of the Bible, tell me what is the truth. And when I read that the very first time, which was a long time ago, I just assumed Jesus would start out with some kind of Old Testament scriptures or start out with something trying to convert him into what was the truth. In other words, the truth was a construct. The truth was a philosophy. It was something that you believe. But I was shocked to find that he said nothing. You ask uh, any, any type of Christian what the truth is, they'll give you verse and scripture and ver uh, chapter and dogma and all this kind of stuff because they're trying to convert you to what they believe is true. And I thought, Something came to me and said, the answer is in the silence. And I do think if you want to behold the face of God, start with silence. Silence is the face of God. Why? Because it's something you cannot define, non-local, undefinable, has no beginning, has no end. And how can you experience that but the silence? Before you think one thought or one word, you're beholding the face of God is silence. 
Be still and know. Very famous. So the answer was in this term, I am the truth. He did not want us to think he just had the truth. See, this is what Christianity has done. It's taken Jesus and the teachings as the truth without understanding that I am the truth. Therefore, the truth is an identity, not a philosophy, a theology, or a mental construct of any kind. It is I am the truth. Say that. I am the truth. That's it. Stop. Don't explain and interpret. Just be in the silence of your being. One more time. I am the truth. Now Christians tell me that if someone does not accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, they cannot make it in to heaven or to God because it says unless you believe. Well, uh, that Jesus is the Son of God, you should not enter into the, the, the kingdom. But the thing they don't understand is those words did not come from the man Jesus. It came through the man Jesus from a point in consciousness that we all share, and that is I am. Say it again. I am the truth. So, I had to say that because nobody gave me the answer, and you should have had that answer. I've said it probably many times in the last five years. It's about you saying the capital T truth. That's from the Ark of the Scripture. Yeah, well, the others are little T truths. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, capital T. If I say capital T, I mean capital T truth. We're in that way. All right, so the whole class today is on an introduction, more or less, but it is on the idea of setting the context which has completely, as far as I'm concerned, been ignored throughout Christian teaching. So we're about to embark on a, I think, exciting and a great adventure. The path we will take is an unusual journey into the mysterious and often elusive world of the Near East. Again, I will share with you and to those who are online that maybe have not heard me talk about one of the great seedings of my higher self was a realization that nobody in the Bible spoke English, which is assumed by most Western Christians who take their definition about God and spiritual things from a text such as the Bible. And the answer to that is, which Bible? Now, in the time I was being raised up in fundamental Christianity, it was pretty much settled on the King James Version. There wasn't much else that was accepted except King James Version, which they believed to be God's version. And they believed that the Bible was, was God's book about man. And I've learned that the Bible is man's book about God. So I realized that if no one spoke English, what did they say? I'm just assuming that out of nothing and nowhere in the cosmos of the universe, this voice comes out, let there be light. <laughs> of course, I had a little southern accent, you know. <laughs> God would have a little bit of southern accent. <laughs> no. We can't build from there. We can't build upon the languages that are the furthest interpretations from the original context of language and culture in which these people embodied. <clears throat> and again, I say to you that I was very warned growing up in the church to stay away from Eastern teachings. Isn't that 
a little bizarre. Control. When everybody <laughs> in the Bible came from the east, and I was supposed to ignore anything that came out of the east, and like Jesus didn't. <laughs> Not from Poughkeepsie. That he maybe was born somewhere in Kansas in a barn or something, I don't know. I mean, th these are just common sense points in which consciousness, real consciousness starts coming alive in your human consciousness. It's the seedings of spirit. I gave you, I gave you a scripture a Sunday or a couple of Sundays ago in Matthew 24 and 7 that tells us, for as the lightning comes from the east and shines to the west. That's King James Bible. What do I hear? Matthew 24, 7 says, for as the lightning shall come from the east. Now lightning, oh my God, I could just talk on that. I mean, lightning is an electrical charge that happens in the magnetic field part of your brain. It's when information, light, data, photons are activated in the magnetic field of your brain and you get that epiphany moment. It's like lightning. I get it. You ever had that happen? I mean, it wasn't even a situation of arriving mentally to that. It just came in. And you just had this spark of knowing and clarity that just happened to you, that aha moment. That is the lightning coming from the east into the west. So as we travel through the pages of the Bible, we shall unlock many mysteries, many mysteries. Oh my goodness. Lamsa himself says that 40% of everything that is used in the Bible is a Aramaic idiom which you're going to learn a lot about. That means you can't take anything literally or seriously that is in the Bible as far as idioms or stories because they're only understood by the culture of the Near East. The Western mind does not understand it anymore, and I'm going to use this again, that it's raining cats and dogs. If you're foreign and not from America and understand American English idioms, you have no idea, and you're a literalist, I just take everything literal, you're going to be looking out the window for do, uh, cats and dogs. Or you can say, oh no, it doesn't mean that. It means it's raining real hard because you understand the idiom. Most of the teachings that came through the teacher, Jesus, was unraveling, trying to unravel the idioms. And that's why he's, it's recorded that he said in translation, my words are in the parables. Don't you get it? Where's his word? In the parables. Oh, it's not the parable. It's not. It's raining cats and dogs. It's in the definition and the meaning of what that means that comes into you. And you go, oh, I got the meaning of what was said. If you don't, all you're going to do is download it in your head and have a, another mental construct of something and then you say, I believe in it without understanding it. There's nothing worse than qualify a belief you don't understand. Because the power is not in the belief. The power is in the understanding of the thing that you believe. So my words are in the parable. Then it also, and I'm using total English King James language here to show you it's right there. It's not really as hidden as we think it is. If we would get out of our dogma and take off our lens and glasses of, of Christianity and see it for what it is in the, in the true context of what it is, people, I, I, I tell you, you wouldn't have to go through years of theology school to learn this stuff. It just takes good old innate common sense to get through some of this kind of outward perception 
that is being believed in as fact. He says, often, in translation, you that have ears, hear. Now, I don't think he was talking about just physically deaf people who had an impairment. I think he's talking about people who do not understand. You that can understand and understand it because you're in a place to understand it. He knew that everybody wasn't at the same place and level of consciousness, and you can't receive what you're not in the place to receive. Remember that. You can never receive what you're not in the place to receive. Say it with me. I cannot receive what I'm not in the place to receive. So that's what Heartlight's about, and the teachings, and the classes, and the messages are all trying to tune us and change us to different levels of consciousness so that we can be an initiate to receive from the higher consciousness of, of universal mind. Christ consciousness, whatever you want to want to call it. Another thing he under, said, according to translation again, is that right now you cannot understand it, but the Father shall show it to you plainly. You know that's in there? You don't understand it now, but it shall be shown unto you plainly. And Yeshua, as a true visionary, oh, I, I, I believe he comes from a line of visionaries all the way from David, all the way down to all, anybody that was a part of that bloodline, of uh, House of Judah uh, bloodline uh, that had the priest-king bloodline, which Jesus was. I don't want to get into that either. But it just bothers me that they've so watered him down to be the son of a poor carpenter. That's ridiculous. He had royal blood in him. He was not a carpenter. That word carpenter means craftsman. Look it up. Tekon. Craftsman. These were people who had a craft. They learned. Jesus learned and grew in grace and knowledge. He wasn't just born of Mary a virgin and knew everything. He had to go through the process which Christianity has edited out for you and I. There is no process. Just come down, shake my hand, accept Jesus as your personal Savior, join the church, pay your tithes, and wait for heaven. <laughs> just wait for heaven. Wait to die. Wait for death to come and get you. Take you off. So, what we're going to talk about today is from the influence of my mentor in 1990, uh, Dr. Rocco Errico. Dr. Errico is the true protege of Lamsa. He worked with Lamsa and he continued to take Lamsa's work to levels that Lamsa never attained in his lifetime. When I first heard about that Jesus most likely spoke the Aramaic language, I was fascinated enough to check him out. He is the founder of the foundation of Nura, N-O-R-H-A, which means light in Aramaic, the Nura Foundation. I found out that they were having an intensive workshop, week workshop, in the mountains in California, about two hours out of Los Angeles. And being young and brave in those days, I don't think I would do it now, but I literally flew to Los Angeles and rented a car and drove two hours my gosh, just on getting through L.A. is an accomplishment. And drove up in the mountains to this wonderful, powerful retreat in which we learned the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic. Now, what's ironic that I want to throw in here is the first time that I taught that in Charlotte in 1988 or 9 was in this place that you're sitting. You guys are just on one year did you open it? 
Okay, that's then it was. It was 94. Nancy Ennis was here for a time helping Elizabeth and brought me in to teach the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic. This was brand new, it had just been opened. And that was 96. Okay, whenever that was, whenever you opened it, that's the year. It's all, the years are blur to me. But that was done right here in this space that I've ended up with. What, all these years and decades later? Talk about making full circle, but spiraling and not repeating the circle, but moving on. It was right here. So I've kind of made that a part of my teachings throughout all these years and decades, uh, which is quite fascinating, and that will be a part of this class that we will go through uh, the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic. But let's talk a little bit about Aramaic. <clears throat> So I'm going to share with you a little history about it so that you can uh, kind of understand. Aramaic is thought to have first appeared among the Armenians in about the 11th century BCE, before Common Era. By the 8th century before Common Era, it had become accepted by the Assyrians as a second language. Aramaic is the oldest continuously written and spoken language in the Middle East. It is older than Hebrew and Arabic in written languages. They were writing and speaking Arabic, uh, 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 Aramaic. Aramaic, I got too many words, first. Equally important, it has been the role of the Aramaic as the oldest continuously used alphabetically written language in the world. That sounds pretty important to me. So how can I build my Hebrew, my Greek, my Latin, my English, or any other language that is on the earth today without building it upon the oldest spoken and written language that was on the planet? Okay. Were they Jews that spoke Aramaic or not? Yes, they spoke it first, then Hebrew. Yeah. Yeah. Right here, it answers that, I think. Ancient Hebrew, as in Paleo Hebrew, the original Hebrew language came from the Canaanite Phoenician alphabets like the feature, which is featured below, Biblical Hebrew is a fusion of this language and Imperial Aramaic, both featured below. So absolutely, Aramaic was first and then Hebrew blended in to it. Now there's some words uh, that, that, uh, uh, that we know that Jesus spoke that were Hebrew. But his main language is Aramaic with Hebrew loan words. In other words, if there wasn't a word in Aramaic, he would borrow from the Hebrew. And boy, does it make a difference once you start bringing these together to, to get the real understanding of what was given to you. If you take it from uh, English to Greek, for instance, when he's on the cross, supposedly, and says to them, uh, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken you? You don't like that, I bet. Like, what father would send his son down here and die and be hung on a cross and whatever? My goodness, I'd never do that to my child. But that's not what it originally says. What it really says, for this was I born. For this was my purpose and destiny. He wasn't blaming God for it. He was fulfilling a destiny, whatever that means. And that's another thing you've got to get in to find out what, what all of that basically means. From the time of Jesus, where Aramaic and Hebrew both was in use by the Jews, and what, are, what is the difference between these languages is Hebrew was just modern Aramaic. Hebrew, now I'm going to tell you guys something, get you notebooks. I'm going to get you notebooks. You must take notes in these classes. 
I don't have the ability, I wish I did, to have more uh, going on up here and PowerPoints and stuff. Tim doesn't have the time and, and whatever, so it's going to be up to you for you to start making uh, some, some notes uh, to do that. We're going to be using uh, seven keys to this subject, which are first, which was started today, the Aramaic language itself. Secondly, we're going to cover the idioms of the Bible. Three, the mysticism of the Near East. Fourth, the culture of the Near East. And finally, the psychology of the Near East. So let's look a little bit. Sure. The Aramaic language, the idioms of the Bible, the mysticism of the Near East, the culture, and the psychology of the Near East. Okay. Um, oh, sorry, there's more. Uh, I can't read my writing. One's the application of the Near East, and I can't read my writing on the other side. Wait, I'll tell you what, I can do it right here, it's right here. I'm going to go through them again. Aramaic language, one. Idioms of the Bible, two. Mysticism of the Near East, three. Four is culture of Near East. Five is psychology of Near East. Six is symbolism of the Near East. And seven, Near East amplification. Amplification. Why seven? Because in the Eastern... Eastern people believe that numbers have more meanings than just numerical value. They believe that the number seven is the most sacred of all numbers. An Easterner usually sees the number seven in his everyday conversation. Much like in Soul Energetics, we look for three, six, and nine, which is Tesla's quote, when man understands three, six, and nine, he'll have the key to the universe. The biblical authors use the sacred number seven even more frequently in their writings. Some Bible author authorities claim that the adoption of the number may have come from ancient belief that there are seven planets. So that's why we don't use seven in numerology as completion, as I was taught in Christianity that seven was completion because of this idea of uh, uh, the seven days of creation, which there wasn't. There was only six. I don't know why they say seven because... He rested on the seventh, so they don't even have that quite right. Um, you know, they don't know what they're saying half the time, even their own Bible or what it says. Um, and the fact that it was uh, in a time which we had less information about ourselves and our galaxy and universe, that's all changed. So you can't say that seven's built upon the fact there's only seven planets because we know better than that. So that's why we more follow the Pythagorean numerology path that the number of completion is nine, not seven. So I want to make that clear. Can somebody tell me why nine is completion using the numerical Pythagorean uh, scheme? What's the last number before you go into one and zero. Again. Exactly. Nine. When you go to ten, what is one plus zero? One. one. New beginnings. New, new beginnings. beginnings. So, and I taught that for years, that eight was new beginnings, because that's the Christian take on it. But that is not correct. So we have to do a little updating as we, we go along with some of these things like, like that. So the seven, uh, what they believed was the sun, the moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. It's very important to know that the Eastern setting in which the Bible originated, we often forget that the sacred literature itself is an Eastern book. Let me give you one example that's kind of interesting. 
One time Jesus, two things it says. One, he spit on the ground and made some mud and put it in a guy's eye. That ain't good Western stuff. I would not suggest that you go out and make some mud and put it in somebody's eye. Another place, he literally put spittle in somebody's eye without the mud. What is going on? See, those stuff are, are ignored because that's uncomfortable. We wouldn't do that, so let's just ignore that. But actually, if you would have been a Near Eastern person and understood the custom, what he was, uh, there was a belief at that time that the spittle of the firstborn son of a family had some kind of magic in the spittle that healed people. So what he was saying, using the, uh, the method of teaching at that time, was I'm the firstborn. I'm the firstborn, which metaphysically means I want the first ones to know that God is incarnated into the human story. Yeah. Isn't that great? I'm the first one. I get it. He began the whole ability of incarnation of the divine into the human. And then he said, oh, make them one. What a great prayer. Father, make them one. What does that mean? Making your human and your divine self one new creation. You get it? That, that makes you born again. You're no longer just of a human species believing in a spiritual religion, but now you become the spirit itself incarnated and manifested in human flesh, and he was the first to get it. Somebody said, no, no, Buddha did not get it. No, Buddha got enlightenment, but he didn't get the divinity thing at all. None of the other teachers did. Jesus is the only one that brought in the universal mind of God into the human story. And let me just throw this in. How he got there was not being born of Mary, a virgin, 33 years ago or 30 years ago. He got there by many incarnations from the first Adam to become the last Adam. Did you? I got that verse for you. I gave it to you. Oh, I didn't give it to you. Oh, she has it for you. <laughs> <laughs> he asked for that scripture. The la Jesus, the last Adam. So if he's the last Adam, he must have been the first Adam and all the Adams in between. Because Adam doesn't mean a one-man name. It means a bloodline. So there was many. Maybe he was uh, Abraham. Maybe he was Moses. Maybe he was uh, Elijah. Maybe he was uh, this, that, and another. That whole line finally shows up as the last Adam who ends up shedding his bloodline. Oh, I don't hear what this bloody thing on the cross and whatever. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. What's going on there? Why is the Bible so bloody? From blood, blood of goats and sheep and all kinds of crazy stuff like that. Because it's trying to tell you that something was going to change in the blood line of humanity. And that blood, which is congealed, trapped light in the veins of your body, will be turned back into light again as you become a light being. That's why this story of the transfiguration is so important when Jesus goes to the high mountain. Never those words in the Bible again. There's hills and there's mountains, but this was the high mountain of consciousness. He went in such a high state of consciousness that what was in him outrayed him and he immersed himself into his own inner self. He took his outer self and immersed himself into his own inner self until he wore, as it were, a garment of light. He wore his inner light as a garment on the outside. And at that moment, his old Adamic blood was changed to light. 
in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he's going, oh, I, I know that I've got to fulfill my destiny, but I'd rather this cup pass from me. I really don't think this is going to be fun. And nevertheless, thy will be done. But it said, and when he prayed that, he prayed so deeply that he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. <sighs> Whose blood? Adam's blood. The old Adamic human race. I got to give you this scripture. For life is in the blood. Scripture. Life is in the blood. Another. And the life is the light of men. Why? Why, why haven't they con connected these dots? I don't understand. Why they can't read their Bible right and with spiritual eyes and see that life is in the blood and that life becomes the light of men. Look me up and find out that they know that your blood is congealed light. It is light that is caught in the density of the human body and turned to blood. But when your blood is turned back into light, it will outray your whole humanity and you will wear your inner divine self on the outside. And you know what some people are calling that? The Merkaba, the Merkaba, the light body. It's, it's just, it's there. It's just there. Wow. You know me, I go off a little trail, trails, but I hope that it's spirit that's doing it, not, not just, just me. The majority of the teaching was written in the Semitic, to Semitic people. You have to understand Jesus' method of teaching. He was a rabbi which means teacher. Now even metaphysical unity and all of that except the fact Jesus is the way shore and the teacher. They'll let you go that far. <laughs> which I appreciate that because there's some metaphysical that won't even go that far. They don't want to know nothing about Jesus at all. He, they discontinued him completely and that is too bad for me because I think you everyone need a map, you need a sample, and you need an example. So when you're in these teachings of we're going to become spiritual people and we're going to become light beings and we're going to have these new bodies and all this kind of thing, what is your prototype for that? How do you get there? What is your map and road to get there? Or are we just talking goals? Which the, the human mind says, if you'll just believe it, it'll happen. Hey, let me tell you after 60 years, it don't work. I've believed some bizarre things. I mean, believed it. I believed it. Preached it, taught it, ate it, drank it, thought it. Because until I understood the prototype what would it look like if I was whole? Now we talk about that a lot here. We're whole. What does that look like to be whole to you? Well, if I was you, I'd pick someone like Jesus or somebody. That, if you can find another one, go for it. And say, what would it be like to be able to speak to one, one form of uh, of atoms and molecules and repattern it through alchemy from water to wine. That wasn't magic. It was science. Jesus was science. He was a quantum man. It's taken us 2,000 years to even catch up. That's why he said, I'll show you the way. I am the way. And religion thinks the way is back to him. No, the way is from him to you. I'm going to show you the way to you. The one that's buried in the grave of your mind. 
and you've rolled the stone over it. And now you think your DNA is written in stone and you think your ancestry story is written in stone and there's nothing you can do about it. I say roll the stone away. And say to that what you thought was dead, come ye forth. <laughs> come forth out of the grave. And look up the word grave. It's in my book, but it means the darkened aspect of the mind in the Greek. Are you with me? Yeah. I'm just laying a foundation here. You know me and my foundations. In 1943, the Roman Catholic uh, uh, encyclopedia issued by the Pope stressed the need for interpreting the scriptures to apply their lessons to present conditions. They emphasized the importance of studying the, the biblical language of Aramaic and Hebrew as a sound basis for understanding the scriptures. Come on, Catholic Church. Maybe we shouldn't throw that all away because some interesting popes have shown up here lately that is trying to rewrite that story. Aramaic was the tongue spoken by Jesus Christ. And in 1971, the Roman Catholic faith placed greater emphasis on the Bible. Finally, 1971. The oldest supposedly universal Christian church in the world went from 400 century A.D. all the way to 1971 before they admit they were not fallible or infallible, but fallible. It took them forever to admit they were wrong about certain things that science had proved they were wrong about. But if they did, they would have been seen as fallible. And they wanted to remain the infallible university, universal church. The Vatican Ecumenical Council put the Bible in a place of prime importance in the church. No longer do Roman Catholic biblical experts treat it as though it, was, uh, uh, though it were factual in every detail. Like their Protestant colleagues, they are investigating the possibility that the Bible expresses ideas rather than clear-cut history. Pretty good, huh? They are digging into Hebrew and Aramaic texts. They are searching for meanings perhaps still hidden. Somebody had to come along sometime and start addressing the hidden mystery. There's a scripture that comes to my mind right now, I think it's in Proverbs, but it said, it is the honor to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings to search out a matter. This is your royal priesthood part of you. It is your authority and right to discover what's been concealed from you. In fact, it is your responsibility. When you stepped your foot on a spiritual path, you took on a responsibility to solve the mysteries of that which has been concealed from the world. Yes, I cannot imagine coming in and hearing me and some fundamentalists that had no, no moment of real seeding of anything, how my must sound to them. I would be the most blasphemous, but so was Jesus. Jesus was seen as black. In fact, that's why they did crucify him, whatever that means. I won't get into that right now, but you have to define what crucifixion was. But the fact that they did, it wasn't that they bothered because he turned water into wine or raised a dead man or did these things. That was fine. It's when he said, I am God. That got him. We got to get rid of this man because he claims to be God incarnate. And trust me, if you walk out of here and start telling people you are God, little G-O-D. They'll try to crucify you. 
one way or another, because they'll, they'll do it. Another scripture comes to me is Jesus saying to them that they shall cast you out of the synagogues and kill you thinking they have done God a service. You know, that's going on in this world today, that people are killing other people because they think it's pleasing God, their God. That gives people the power to, to do what they do, to pull the trigger, to do whatever, because they really think they're in God's service. So did Hitler. Get rid of the Jews. When you get rid of the Jews, because they have the seed of the devil in them. Because Adam, um, Eve, and and uh, the serpent produced the seed of the serpent. <laughs> That's what they believe. And that was the Jewish people. The, the hatred for Jewish people has been the fact that they hold the seed of the serpent in them. And when you get rid of a Jew, you get rid of the devil. Same with African American people of color. There's also beliefs out there that they have no soul, that when you get rid of these people, you're getting rid of... I, I mean, I could go on and on. Any, any people who have suffered any persecution of any kind like that is get rid of them and you'll get rid of the issue. It's all over. It's all over. Oh, I don't even want to go there. That's, that's too much. I know that's too much. But I've studied these things years ago. I've walked among them. I've walked among them in the Ozarks and the mountains of Arkansas. I told you about teaching in this place. Oh, my God, it was the scariest place. I don't know how I got there. In, in the Ozarks somewhere, and this guy sat on the front row with a knife this big cleaning his fingernails, and he looked like he had crawled out from a rock somewhere. And when I got through, I said, anybody have anything to say? He said, well, I have one thing to say. Hitler did not finish killing those goddamn Jews and homosexuals. And I looked at my friend who was with me, who was gay, and my, his friend, and we looked at you, they're like, stay cool. <laughs> and let's just wait and we'll and slip like out that. as quietly as we can. <laughs> oh, the stuff I've been through, let me tell you, it's crazy. But British Israelism, I tapped into that back in the 70s. British, only white, American, British, Europeans are the race of Adam. And they're, they've got scripture for it. All this stuff they got scripture for. You can get scripture for anything you want if you've got a belief. But these are supposedly people who believe in Jesus Christ. And that just confuses me when he saw no boundaries between people. They even had a fit when he talked to a Samaritan woman. The fact that he talked to a woman without her husband and a Samaritan who was not just of the Jewish, you don't do that, Jesus. You're Jesus the Christ. You don't do that. And Jesus went, oh, I forgot. I wasn't supposed to do that. In other words, he forgot the boundaries he had been taught and cross them. And I can show you many times that they hated him for it. He, he, he crossed the race, the gender, the religious. Every kind of boundary and box that had been made, he didn't fit in any one of them. And they hated him for it, much as they would hate you today because of your Inclusion. Oh, so much. Aramaic is far from being a dead language. To this very day, Aramaic is spoken in various parts of the world. There are many Assyrian Aramaic speaking communities, large and small throughout the United States, Lebanon, Iraq, Iran, Sweden, and Australia. 
Hmm? Sure. Uh, United States, Lebanon, Iraq, Iran, Sweden, and Australia. Jesus, his apostles, and contemporaries taught and preached in the Aramaic language throughout Asia Minor. Tells us that the Gospel of Matthew was written in Hebrew language, i.e. Aramaic. And he's written a whole book on the book of Matthew in Aramaic. And it's totally different as it is, is seen. The Bible is filled with idioms and idiom phrases. Let me give you the most bizarre one I can think of right now is when I was doing my ministry as a young man in Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and all the deep, deep south people would approach me and say, we have brought rattlesnakes. Can we bring them into the service? And this had become a part of the very deep Pentecostal, a certain sect of Pentecostalism, which took the scripture, for ye shall handle serpents and they shall not harm you. You shall drink poison and it shall not kill you. That's an idiom, for God's sake. <laughs> and a lot of them got bitten and died, and some of them didn't. Because they didn't really have maybe the fear. I don't know. And it's still going on. In fact, there's some documentaries on, on uh, Netflix and different ones that shows these, uh, these churches and, and what they basically do. But in the, in the Aramaic, what he was saying is, if anyone gossips or try to poison your reputation, do not worry about it because it does not have to affect you. So now you all go, hmm, that sounds better. Because poison is in the tongue. Even the Bible says that. People could disregard your reputation, lie on you, try to destroy you, whatever. But it says you don't have to give in to that. It does not have to harm you. You know who you are. You know you're the center of your power. How many of those things people have bought into in which they've missed the true power of what was being said through the idioms? Our time is... Um, Moving on here, so. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about a lot of things, like, for instance, what does Satan mean in Aramaic versus how it's been interpreted through the other languages into the English language? All these things are basically, all have a different definition when we look at them in the Aramaic, uh, Aramaic language. The purpose of this class is to clarify obscure passages of scripture and many concepts of God, man, and the universe which we may have incorrectly understood from the biblical writers. By understanding the Bible from an Eastern perspective, we shall see more clearly an authentic and wholesome image of ourselves. Do you realize what's been assassinated and aborted? is your image of yourself as you were created to be. The Bible says that the word can be as sharp as a two-edged sword. I want to talk about that just for a moment. I've got a few minutes. And I want to end with experience. I don't want to be just knowledge. And I've told this before, but I failed to do it again. When I first received what was called the Holy Spirit and had the experience that transformed and changed my life and put me on the path that I've been on for 60 years, I now see it as a penetration of divine mind penetrating human mind. Why? Because I opened my womb the womb in consciousness. 
when I opened the womb to receive. See, that, that's the story of Mary. Mary wasn't getting it because she didn't open her womb to receive it. I know no man. I don't know how this is going to happen. She was totally closed. And that's why it said that she needed the Holy Spirit to prepare her so her womb would be open so she could deliver and bring forth. Now take that metaphysically. All of you have a womb in your consciousness. Did you know the word womb is translated five times in the Bible matrix? Look it up. The matrix is in the Hebrew the word womb. So I received it that night 60 years ago, in which I experienced the penetration of divine mind into my human mind, which charged me like charging my battery that was pretty low at that time, and charged me with something so powerful, as I've told you, that it just knocked me on the floor. Just like somebody just lifted me on the floor. And I laid there, and I saw a heart, a heart, it was a heart, just the shape of a heart as we know it, and the heart was rather dark and shady, it looked like looking into a, a pit of something. And something he said to me, that's the part of the human aspect of your heart where you have put in things like jealousy in the, you know, human traits, lower, what we call lower human traits. That's where racism would start and all the isms would start in that lower aspect of it. But, but what happened that I want to share with you is in the midst of all of that was the most beautiful, tiny, luminous, white heart I've ever seen. In fact, I could never reveal it through human concepts. It literally glistened with life and it was a little heart and something said to me, this is me. And I knew that that me was the seed of God planted in my heart. And the next thing that was formed in my consciousness was feed me. Because you see, everybody was feeding what's wrong. Sin, all the bad things you did, that's all they talked about. And they were feeding the very thing that they wanted to get rid of in people. They were, they were energizing the very thing they wanted to get rid of by addressing it all the time and talking about it. And they were neglecting what was trying to grow in them was the Christ seed, the sperm of God, the DNA of God placed in them. And I realized, and that set me on a precedence of teaching more on love and unity and, and things. And they didn't like that because they wanted me to talk about bad things and scare people so they'd get saved. And I was talking about growing in the spirit until we come to the fullness of the stature of Christ and be no more as children being tossed to and fro ever with. They're going, I'm saved. I don't need to grow. And I knew that was Christ in me, the hope. Now, and our time's going to run out, but I'm going to finish this. Is that Okay. So I was a part of a movement that happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma in around 1962 when all this took place. And I've told you about it. It was a phenomenal thing of this little church and they knocked the wall out and put a tent until there was all, uh, several thousand people that ended up in this eight week revival every night. People were just being drawn in. Some people thought they saw fire on the roof and there wasn't fire, it was Holy Ghost fire. All kinds of things happened. This was a, a visitation that I was able to live in while living in Tulsa at that time. 
Well, a lot of us received what we call the Holy Spirit. A lot of young people that I knew from the church, because I knew a lot of people because of my aunt's position and being her, her pianist and all that, I knew. And I was known, well known and um, all of that. Anyway, I, and, and this place that I received this experience, I loved it. It was, my, it was now my church, and they wanted me to be the choir director. And all kinds of great things were happening to me. And in the midst of that, Spirit said, Come out of her, saith the Lord. I got to leave? Oh, my God, where am I going? Where am I going to go? And then I had a lot of friends that said, no, I'm staying. I like it here. And a lot of those that's, okay, here's what happened. After the revival is over, every church in Tulsa were like vultures to get new members. So they were coming in and giving us their dogma. For instance, like, you need to be baptized in Jesus' name, or, you, or no. Well, you should be baptized in the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And they were dividing everything up based on dogma and doctrine. But something took me out of all of that because a lot of my friends lost what they had. Especially a dear, dear friend of mine who ended up on alcoholism and drugs who had a wonderful experience but got so confused. And what, what happened is that the preachers out there took the sword of the literalism of the letter of the word and stuck it in the womb of a seed that was trying to be formed in them and tried to abort it. That's why the Apostle Paul, it is said, said, I'll travail with you and I will stay with you until Christ be formed. Being born again doesn't mean just being born again. It means you've got to be conceived again and you've got to go through gestation again to be born again. Look up the word born again. It means the whole cycle of conception, gestation, and birth. Don't you see? God, whatever you want to call it, took me out to save me from the abortionist aborting what was in me. I had to get away from it. I had to get out of it. And I'm saying this to you, not with arrogance or ego, but with humility. That is why I'm where I am in my understanding and teaching is I continue to feed that which was being formed in me. And I don't know about you, but I'm ready to birth this thing. Yeah, it's getting a little uncomfortable in this period of gestation that we've been carrying. Ah, let's all take a deep breath. I hope that you're going to enjoy so much of what we're going to go through and understand. And also the little sidelines that uh, Spirit shows up for. We don't want to just take a book and just read it and do that. We also want Spirit to speak to us and to guide us in that way. Holy Spirit, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you that you are the voice of God at the human level that we can receive teaching in ourselves and understanding and remembrance and guidance. We totally release the outcome of these classes to you that your will will be done and your purpose shall be accomplished for this class, that you will draw who's to be drawn to this class, both here and online and later. We are still in such a time of correction. For we're looking for that word of God that is inspired, that is profitable for doctrine, correction, and reproof. As we read more and more the dead bones of man's traditions, and become a clearer, cleaner vessel for your consciousness to flow through into the world. We thank you for showing up in these classes. And now we call, invoke the blessings of El Elyon, the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, 
without mother, without father, without beginning or ending of days of the divine Melchizedek order of an endless life. And so it is. So it is. Y'all are wearing me out. In a good way, in a good way. <laughs> All right, please remember your support and offerings are so important to the class and to keeping us free to, uh, to be what we need to be in spirit. And I thank you for it. Do need your continuous support. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right, again, Sunday, for you that were not here earlier, is a time change. Meditation starts at 1030. Doors will be shut, and uh, we decided that if people come a little later and want to, these doors will be shut, and you can sit in the, in the lobby and meditate with us if you come later than 1030. We're, that's what we're trying to do. If not, you go next door to the lighthouse where there'll be some coffee, maybe water for tea, and any, anything anybody wants to bring, uh, if you want to bring something for a healthier uh, snack of some kind, uh, that's fine too. It's up, up to you guys to do that. So please um, realize that we're doing a little adjusting and changing uh, starting this, this Sunday. Thank you so much for coming out. Appreciate it. Have a great day. Have a great rest of the week. And we hope to see you Sunday at 1030 for meditation, 11 for service, and next Wednesday for yoga. <laughs> yeah. And a couple quick things. Reminder, yes. we do have sacred geometry on Friday. Hold on just a second. A reminder that we have our sacred geometry on Friday. Yes, thank you. And our intro to Tantra on Saturday as well. Yeah, let's talk about that. I really don't know how these two things kind of went back to back. That wasn't probably the uh, wisest thing to do, but it's just the way it is. So I know uh, some of you are gonna have to make some decisions. I definitely hope that you will come Friday night for the uh, sacred geometry and learning that because that's going to be a precursor to some of the workshops that we're going to be doing here pretty soon in the next couple of months or so. So anything that has to do with sacred geometry, the golden mean, ratios and all of that, which is the language of the universe is what you're going to learn. You're going to learn how the universe, that maybe God was an architect with intelligence. <laughs> and had an intelligence to it, to come out. And that starts, I'm sorry, uh, is it f seven o'clock? Friday at seven o'clock. And uh, Sandra, how, Sandra, Sandra. Uh, yeah, I got you, I got you, Sandra. Uh, how long you plan to do this? Seven o'clock to? 8.30. 8.30, okay, seven to 8.30 on Sunday. And of course, I want to promote uh, Kara's Friday. Uh, so Saturday is Kara's, and that's in the Saturday morning. So that's a lot that weekend. I know for you that drive, that, that's a lot. So uh, I, know, I know she has some good things. I know that. I've talked to her. She's very intelligent. And uh, I don't want you to get closed mind that you think all Tantra is about uh, sexual and people having sex and all that. It's, uh, it goes much, much more beyond that. So if that doesn't work for that time, maybe that can be repeated at another time, or and, we will we'll And try for to. that Saturday class, I will be streaming that. So there for those who came on Friday and can't come Saturday, I will stream that There on you Saturday. go, so you can do it on streaming on Saturday or download it even later, uh, that'd be fine. I'm gonna try to do all this, so we'll see how it goes. But then I have Sunday to consider and think about too. So we're busy here at Heartlight, which is a good thing. You know, we're a thriving, living organism, not a dead organization. So we're ever, ever growing and maturing. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you.